I'm Paul Shard, and my wife Cheryl and I are currently home editing and isolating in Canada. This episode was filmed in January 2020 BC, that's before COVID. So if you're hoping to plan your own escape, perhaps before the next flu season, then come along with us to the Bahamas on distant shores. We show our process for passage planning with an overnight sail in the Exuma Islands, share techniques for shallow water piloting, and meet a farming family that found an affordable way to escape for the winter. In the last episode of Distant Shores, we flew from the Bahamas to Toronto to help snowbound sailors plan their escape. And a few will be joining us on board back in the islands for some hands-on experience. Well, we just came and took the water taxi over. So we're back on the dock here and uh, come back from a week in Toronto. We're starting off on one of the biggest journeys of our sailing career. We head into the South Pacific and Panama coming up next. Uh, my husband's always been interested in liveaboard cruising and I've been very hesitant and not confident as a crew member. And the first time we went on a sail away week, it did a lot for my confidence. We've got a breezy day with an onshore swell in the harbour entrance as we set off from Georgetown. The tide is falling, so it's rough in the channel with wind against the current flowing out. But as soon as we get through the cut, the seas lay down for a nice sail 21 miles up the island chain. on distant shores we're joined by four sail away week crew all eager to see the Bahamas and we're lucky to get a run of excellent weather for the week we're sailing but when we arrive at the channel back onto the banks the ebb tide is at full strength with the current against the seas giving conditions known as a rage look over there look at all the waves washing up on shore. That's the rage. So right now we've got the tide is just ebbing off the banks into the sound. Water ebbing out comes into the contact with these big huge swells we were getting that got suddenly much taller and they call it a rage. Crossing from the deep water of the Exuma Sound back to the Great Bahama Bank side of the cut means shallow waters and protected anchorages as we explore behind the Exuma Island chain. Here we enter the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. This area was created in 1958 to preserve and protect this unique environment. This anchorage is called Cambridge Key, the first anchorage in the 22 mile long park heading north. Although most of these islands are privately owned, visitors are welcome ashore at some of them, including Cambridge Key. The real reason for the creation of the park was to protect the marine life, and no fishing is allowed within the boundaries of the park. But in the Bahamas, all beaches are public up to the high tide mark. The crew enjoys playing on the newly exposed sandbank, of which you'll find many at low tide in the Bahamas. If you're looking for quiet and isolation, this is the place. We want to investigate the snorkeling at a place called Elkhorn Reef. This is a large stand of healthy Elkhorn coral, and we also see more of the commercially valuable fish here as well, such as snappers, grouper, and lobster. Another one's still cooking. Greg is having yeah, fun experimenting in the galley. Escaping by boat provides lots of opportunities to try new things. Do you have a timer set on me? I don't. Okay, uh, how much time left? Wow, look at this fantastic water. It's unbelievable. You can see there's a fish down looking at our anchor. Today we're heading around to another anchorage here in the Exumas. 
we got really lucky as the front is coming in I think a day or so we're gonna have this incredible light calm winds which often come before the front that we're gonna use it to explore some of the shallow waters around here look at this place Piloting in the shallow waters of the Bahamas will allow you to visit more destinations and enjoy more anchorages, as well as being able to find more places to hole up for bad weather, so it's worth learning how to read the color of the water. Note down the tide times before you set sail each day. Time your shallow piloting for high sun and a rising tide. It's easiest to judge water depth with the sun over your shoulder. High sun works best, 9.30 until 3 o'clock. Do not navigate at night. Do not explore in the shallows where there is any ground swell in case you run aground. Do not rely exclusively on waypoints. Cruising guides have waypoints and they're useful, but these are not designed to be used alone. Use your eyes and keep a lookout as well, even when running point to point. Wear polarized sunglasses. They cut the glare on the surface of the water so that you can see down into the water much better when wearing polarized glasses. Keep a good watch. Height helps. Have a lookout standing on the cabin top, bow, or other high point. Do not rely completely on electronics. Know your boat's draft and tolerance to running aground. If you have exposed rudders or propellers, be sure not to run aground. Slow down or stop when you're unsure. Learn to judge the depth by the water color. Deep sapphire blue to swimming pool blue to pale yellow is all sand. Here will be perhaps one meter deep. Brown water will be very shallow water over reef or rock, less than one meter deep. Practice with your depth sounder. Judge the depth ahead, for example, picking a shallower sandy patch, and confirm your estimation as you pass over this patch. Throw a comment below if you'd like a more detailed video on shallow water piloting. We're gonna come into this corner here and anchor for a day or so. There's a cold front coming, I think, or part of one. This is a nice little hidey hole. What a day for it with the light winds. There's only one other boat here, and the crew of SV Freya recognize us and invite us over for dinner. We're later to learn that their escape plan is to live off the sea in their onboard garden. But first, take in this beautiful shallow anchorage of Pipe Creek. You grew the way this the is normally done in China. Cheers again. Cheers, yeah. you go there, Cheryl. Yes, mm. what a special <laughs> evening. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. You're not in the picture, Cupid. Okay. Yeah. Come on, Cupid. <laughs> there we Here we go. Okay. Gosh. Thank you. Gosh, indeed. Look at all that this feast. One. There yeah. you go. This is a Carolina wine and an mm -hmm. amazing dinner. Thank you so much, guys. That's Thanks. fantastic. Wow. Come. Amazing. We head back the quarter mile to our boat in the rain as the front is nearly here. We believe a reliable dinghy and outboard is essential if your escape plan involves spending much of your time at anchor. Tightening up too tight, I gotta let a little bit of chain out. Quality ground tackle is another essential, and I'm letting out more anchor chain to deal with the strong gusts and lock it in again with the chain snubber. This is just as the front is passing. 
and we should be uh, calming down in the next hour or so. We've got a really good, really good holding and just check the anchor out to make sure that that's okay too, that we haven't uh, dragged it all. We decided to get our crew back to Georgetown with an overnight passage and thought it would be useful to share our passage planning process. Today we're going to talk a little bit about passage planning. It's important to do good safe passage plans in order to make sure that you have safe passages when you're cruising. Uh, this is a fairly short passage. We're just going to do 60 miles. Uh, but it's the end of the week. We've had a whole week of cruising around the Exumas here, uh, up in this area. And now we want to get back down to Georgetown at the end of the week. And part of my plan for this was the idea that to make 60 miles, you can either try to fit a really full day of sailing in and arrive late in the day down here, in which case you might end up into trouble trying to make the entrance, which has a bit of a tricky navigation. Or we could leave in the evening and do a night passage down the coast and then arrive in the morning and have as much time as you like, uh, perhaps even going slow to arrive a little later. This is an offshore passage. I thought it would be a good chance to get some night sail experience for the crew who had not done night sailing before and I wanted to give them a really nice start to that. We saw a nice weather forecast for this. We have light winds at southwest and becoming force three to four, which is going to be kind of close, close hauled like that, but to offshore winds, so the sea should be nice and flat. Uh, the winds aren't gonna be that strong. So in other words, we should have a really nice night. So you wanna get people to really fall in love with sailing, get them out in some nice, nice kind of condition so they're gonna enjoy it. So let's take a look at the next part of this. Now we know what we're gonna to try to do is make the passage uh, overnight. Let's take a look at the departure. Okay, so we're in here in Staniel Key, anchored uh, in the area behind, in some bit of protection near the Staniel Key Yacht Club. And the problem with this is that you're gonna have to leave and go out through a really narrow constricted entrance and then out a bit of a dog leg and none of this is lit. So we don't want to go out in the dark. So that's why I thought we'd leave last thing in the afternoon, say 5.30 or 6 o'clock, when there's still a little bit of daylight, and make this navigation. We want to check the tides. We have a low tide at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, high again at 9 o'clock. So that means we have a rising tide as we leave here. So that's good for the plan. So if we do run aground somehow anywhere in here, we're just going to get lifted off as the tide goes higher. And we're going to do a couple of bearings just to make sure that we have an idea of this this tricky little point where we get out and out of the entrance and where we go between a small mark that true to the Bahamas is probably not lit. So we're going to make note of that on the passage plan as well. And then our exit point. Then I'm going to put in a couple of waypoints in the GPS for the point we'll head to just outside of the entrance. And um, a little bit of an offshore point. And from that point, we have a straight shot of something like 50, 50 miles or so uh, down onto Georgetown. I'm going to put those points in the GPS as well. And then we'll go and take a look at this end down here. Now here, I don't want to come in in the dark again, because this is one of the trickiest entrances uh, around. Nowadays with GPS, it's a little easier, but certainly in the first days when we came down here, you were looking at coming in on a bearing angle off of the tree here on the hill and these keys. So you're lining that up to get a running line of something like 194 degrees, I think. The trickiest part of this is that none of this is lit. There's no marks, there's no floating marks, no nothing, but there are reefs near the surface. And it's a little hard to tell which of these keys in a row, which key is which, when you're looking at them as you come down the coast. So you need to have a waypoint here. We'll do that at the GPS waypoint and then head in on a bearing line to make sure we miss everything. And then once you've come in past the reef, you've seen where it is, and you can come along beside it. You can only do that in daylight, though. So uh, that's the Bahamas navigation. Good fun. But in this case, we're going to arrive here around dawn, and if it's still a little dark, we can just wait a little bit, sail a bit more, and then make the entrance and uh, find our way into the anchorage. So that's pretty much our plan for approaching Georgetown from Staniel Key. We can do it leaving at 6 in the afternoon arriving seven in the morning, something like that. Have a nice anchorage, a breakfast and a swim, and we'll be down back in Georgetown.
This did indeed work out to be a lovely night sail, and we're looking at the lights of Great Exuma and Georgetown as the sunrise approaches. We're sailing slowly in light winds and make our entrance to the harbour as planned with daylight to do our bearings and see the rocks in the approaches. And the first time we went on a sail away week, it did a lot for my confidence. And this time it did even more. In fact, last night we did an overnight passage, something I've never done before. And I've never sailed so long in open water. And it was just exhilarating and magical. The luminescent sea creatures that came up as we sailed by were amazing. We could see the Milky Way and layer upon layer of stars and the quiet once we were under sail. It was truly magical. And then sailing in this morning and watching the sunrise as we sailed the boat was, it feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was amazing. And now I'm much more excited about the possibility of living on board full time. A lot of boats in the harbour this time of the year. I think we've got something like, must be approaching 300 boats. By the end of February it'll be almost certainly over 300. Uh, there's still room in here, but when the wind turns around from northwest or west, then that causes a bit of problem. So people have to find a place to go for that, and there's going to be a bit of a blow on Sunday, so we'll keep an eye out. If you're planning your own escape, we're about to introduce you to a crew who explain how to do an amazing family cruise without breaking the bank. While at Exuma Docks putting on supplies, we meet Aaron and Dustin from Ohio, now cruising in the Bahamas. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that you guys have really inspired a lot of people to do uh, adventure and live yeah. different lives. Yeah, so we really Aaron and Dustin, farmers and YouTubers, cruise aboard their 27-foot sailboat with their two daughters. They learn to sail on the Great Lakes and escape to the sea for a few months each year. We invite them on board. I'm Dustin. I'm Aaron. I'm Sierra. I'm Morgan. Aaron and I, when we were teenagers in college, we had a dream. We shared a dream that we always wanted to sail and we wanted to sail the ocean. We always thought that it took this huge yacht, you retire, yeah, a lot of you wealth, you spend a lot of money, land, life. Yeah. yeah, you retire on top of a big pot of gold, or you sell everything you own and move on to a boat. Well, mm -hmm. we started to discover you can actually do it with a very modest income. And what we discovered is most people are more hands-on, figure it out, yeah. do-it-yourself type, rather than super rich paying everybody to do everything. All four of you are on this boat? Yeah. Yeah, it's an Alpen Vega, tw it's 27 feet, and uh, it's eight feet beam. It's cozy. And it's the largest boat you can trailer. So we live in Ohio, and we trailered the boat from Ohio to Florida, and then launched out of Florida into the Bahamas, and it, it's an Alvin Vega made in 1973. So it's 47 wow, it's years old. old. bow. It's well maintained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just polished the steel this morning. Just polished all the stainless steel. <laughs> <today. laughs> that was the girl's job. You're all still friends. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We still Good love friends. each yeah. other. We're full-time farmers. We, we have no desire no desire to leave our land life. We, we, have, we live a very fulfilling life on land. Uh, we provide food for people. Uh, we grow uh, chicken, eggs, beef, pork, and we do it in a regenerative, sustainable type fashion where the land is better the next year than it was the previous year. So we have a lot of purpose and a lot of meaning that comes from our life on land. But our life's mission statement is to increasingly connect with all life around us. and. It's impossible to live on this planet without have without connecting to the ocean uh, because there's so much of it, right. and that has been a good rhythm for us in our life. Is uh, the boat is a vessel for us to connect with the environment, the people around us. The Bahamian mm -hmm. people are amazing, oh, so mm -hmm. amazing human beings, mm -hmm. and connect with each other. Mm -hmm. So living 
uh, full time for four months on kind of almost like arm's length, you yeah, know, away from everyone at all times. You do not have to walk with four people on that boat. You don't have to walk to get something. If somebody's in the V berth, yeah. all you have to do is fire bucket brigade it right up to the cockpit. Yeah. Nothing is ever out exactly. of reach. Yeah, yep, that's what we do. Thanks for watching. Your views, likes, comments, and shares help us a lot. If you'd like more in-depth information and consultation, we invite you to check out the Distant Shores Cruising Club. Membership includes early access to videos, member-only Q&As, live chats, meetups, sailing opportunities, and many other benefits to help you prepare for your own adventure. Thanks again for your support. See you on the water.